Hello everyone, this is Julie Moon, Senior Research Analyst with Finnovate. Today I'm joined by Joe Lichtenberg, Global Head of Product and Industry Marketing at Indersystems. Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Julie. Great. So in this interview, we're going to be focusing on the new normal in financial services. So as, ev as everyone has experienced, the pace of innovation in financial services today is faster than ever before. The confluence incre of increased customer expectations, rising competition from fintechs, and wild interday market fluctuations are creating both challenges and opportunities for financial services organizations. So let's unfold that a bit and jump right into the interview. First off, Joe, let's start by having you introduce yourself and InterSystems to our audience. Sure, thanks again, Julie. Uh, so for those of you that aren't aware, InterSystems is a data management software company. And uh, we uh, have a really wide and deep purview in financial services. We work with more than half of the top uh, global banks. Uh, typically around uh, the more challenging data management initiatives where they need to connect uh, across uh, multiple data silos across the organization, streamline processes, uh, provide access to uh, connected, harmonized data uh, to allow uh, business heads to make better in the moment decisions, whole variety of analytics from business user self-service to machine learning. Um, and again, for a whole range of different types of critical initiatives, and hopefully we'll talk about those on, on this call. And my role here is I am responsible for uh, all of product and industry marketing uh, worldwide for the company. Great, so Joe, to start off, tell us about some of the environmental factors um, that are driving innovation in financial services. Sure, and 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 they and your uh, intro, you talked about uh, a lot of these, but um, you know, for sure, right now there's so much going on uh, in terms of forcing functions, uh, both for established organizations uh, as well as um, startups and innovators and and fintechs and new banks and things like that. Um, and so, um, we tend to think of um, these initiative initiatives both in terms of defensive types of initiatives around enterprise risk and enterprise liquidity risk and compliance and things like that uh, as well as uh, st more strategic and offensive initiatives in fact we just uh, sponsored and executed a survey where we interviewed uh, 100 C-level executives, primarily uh, around uh, data, uh, chief data officers and similar, uh, around uh, their initiatives uh, with top global banks. Uh, and uh, in terms of defensive types of initiatives, it's really interesting. There's, there's still a tremendous amount of effort uh, being applied around uh, risk data aggregation and and CFO out of station, and again, risk and liquidity and compliance initiatives. And in the survey, what we found was that almost 90% of firms are still spending at least 40% of their total budget for, uh, for data, for data and data management, uh, just on compliance activities. Mm -hmm. So there's still a tremendous amount of effort uh, and expense uh, on these defensive types of initiatives. Uh, and surprisingly, even with that uh, level of effort, more than half of firms reported that they're still handling at least 50% of their compliance activities manually. So even with the work that uh, is has been done and continues to be done, there's still a lot to be done there. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. One, I mean, one for sure, you're talking about environmental factors, right? It's really important. So, you know, as, you know, everything's going to real time, and uh, you know, latency concerns are important, and you know, the ability to, to uh, get better information and visibility, you know, across all of the organization's assets, uh, the need to uh, use more data and run more types of analytics, and, and so on and so forth, and especially at the enterprise level, where you have different trading desks and different parts of the organization, different uh, geos doing different things, getting an accurate 
uh, and uh, you know near real time view across the organization of what's happening uh, is high on the priority list for the for really all organizations and the, and the organizations that we're working with. And the other thing that I would say is you know the move to real time and low latency. Uh, you know, has that that's not that new, but especially with with what's happening now uh, in the news with um, the 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 pricing volatility around GameStop, and you know, if you're holding positions, what's your exposure, and you know, uh, uh, end of day rollups, and even rollups that you know are a few hours old aren't sufficient anymore. Um, so. Certainly on, on the, the defensive side, we see a lot. Uh, and then, you know, it certainly makes sense to talk about, you know, what's happening on the strategic side, because there's obviously, you know, tremendous amount of work and innovation happening there as well. So uh, an area where we see a lot of uh, innovation is around improving information for decision support for business managers to have on-demand access to the information that they need uh, across from across the organization, and not just with static reports, but being able to you know dive into live on-demand information and being able to sort of navigate and ask questions and get answers uh, and really understand what's going on in the business in the moment. So we see that a lot. Um, and then, you know, we just we see, you know, data and analytics being used all across the organization for things like improving customer engagement, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, you talk about what are the environmental issues. There's so many, right? I mean, the, the Amazon experience is pervasive. So, uh, you know, consumers, customers, clients, they all expect the Amazon like experience, you know, tremendous amount of effort being put into CX customer experience, uh, you know, and they want their banking experience to be like Amazon and Pandora and the apps that they're using. And so, you know, we see that's, uh, you know, creating a lot of innovation and opportunities for fintechs. And hopefully we have a chance to talk about, you know, what's happening with fintechs. Uh, and then the fintechs uh, are creating lots of pressure on the established financial services firms to be able to innovate. So, you know, with uh, what Robinhood has done for wealth management, trading platforms around engagement and, and gamification, I mean, that's a game changer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so some other environmental factors um, quickly, um, you, know, so, you know, we can't uh, you know, have a, a, an interview, a conversation without talking about the uh, impact of the pandemic and the lockdown. And, so we see a lot around, uh, you know, the move to online self-service. So a lot of uh, uh, banks are closing down branches, right? And so there's a lot around digital transformation and moving these processes that had been interactive and face-to-face, -face, moving them to online uh, and self-service. Uh, there's a lot now around machine learning uh, and advanced analytics being used in all sorts of areas of financial services. So to be able to cross sell and upsell uh, your customers, next best action, how do I capture a larger share of wallet? Um, we have customers that are running machine learning algorithms to predict uh, which of their customers are uh, most likely to churn so they can reduce turnover. We have one of our customers, it's a very large credit union, uh, and they have a very good relationship with their customers. And so they um, used our technology and all the historical data that they have to identify not who is likely to churn, but who is most likely of their customer base to have uh, uh, financial problems. And then they reached out to them directly to see how they could help them. And if, you know, that meant, um, you know, delaying payments or, you know, offering them uh, different uh, payment options and things like that uh, to increase loyalty uh, and make sure that uh, that they were happy. Um, and then and then finally, the last thing um, that we're seeing and, and, you know, it's no surprise is this, you know, this uh, very rapid and aggressive move to the cloud. Uh, and to deploy cloud-based services, 
uh, and for, uh, for uh, large financial organizations and fintechs to deploy uh, uh, services as a service where their clients can, uh, you know, you're not buying, you're renting, and uh, it's just uh, much, much more uh, agile, and, and that really has been a game changer as well. Definitely, yeah, so a lot of factors at play there. So what has been the impact of these environmental factors, these defensive and strategic uh, factors on both fintechs and uh, established organizations? Uh, so for, so let's unpack that separately. So for, for, fintech, for fintechs, uh, I mean, an unbelievable opportunity going on right now. I mean, the, 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 the landscape is ripe for uh, disruption and for fintechs that are able to do something that's differentiated uh, to uh, grow and capture market share away from established organizations. I mean, they have access to cheap capital, like never before, access to cloud infrastructure uh, at, at low cost, and it lowers the risk. So you can just scale, you know, if and when you grow. Better data management technology than ever before to be able to uh, innovate quickly uh, and incorporate machine learning. Uh, just in the last 24 months, there's been a half a trillion dollars in M&A activity uh, globally uh, just in fintechs. And today there's more than 25,000 fintechs worldwide. So for sure, I mean, they're, they're not uh, all gonna grow and be successful, but uh, I mean, the, the, the pace of innovation with fintechs is just unbelievable right now. Things like robo-advisors and digital banks and payments and, and, and lending and personal finance and, and, and insurance. Um, and, you know, the, the key for the fintechs is really around, you know, making use of, data and data management tools and machine learning and providing a, a great customer experience that allows them to do things that uh, you know, allow them to capitalize on white space in the market and, and be able to provide uh, services that are differentiated and better uh, than what the established organizations uh, historically have been able to, to provide and, and stealing market share away from them. And so, you know, from the standpoint of the established organizations, absolutely, you know, they're, they're all feeling the fintechs that are that are nipping at their heels. Uh, you know, so, so you know, why am I going to pay 1% of, of my assets under management when I can use a robo-advisor? If you go to Lemonade, Lemonade's website, right, on the website, right on the, the homepage, they say that it takes 90 seconds for you to get insured and three minutes to get paid. Right. So that's the state of the state right now that, you know, established financial services organizations have to uh, you know, be able to compete with and innovate. So, you know, there's there's innovation everywhere. There's disruption everywhere. Uh, you know, it's a very fast moving time right now. So what what we see with established financial services organizations is, you know, they're for sure not standing still. Uh, they're, they're aggressively innovating as well. Um, and the trend that we see is that they tend to outsource now what's non-core. And the ability to outsource, especially with, you know, being able to incorporate services as a service and, and uh, microservices and, and public APIs and, and SaaS, so they can outsource what's not core, what's not differentiating for them, and really focus on their, their core competencies. Um, and so, you know, it's having a huge impact both, as, as you say, on fintechs and established financial services organizations. Great. Yes, yeah, so lots of opportunity for growth and things are quite fast moving. Great. Yeah, for sure. Totally. Um, as so let's take a look at technology. Would you consider technology to be a hindrance, for example, like in legacy applications or more of an enabler, like with APIs uh, to innovation? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's both, right? I mean, for sure, for fintechs, it's an enabler, right? I mean, with microservices and APIs and uh, the, the ability to work with data and wrangle data and get learnings from the data and create machine learning algorithms and predictive algorithms and operationalizing uh, those algorithms into, you know, really, you know, innovative 
uh, services that do you know new kinds of things and delight customers and provide great customer experience and and so forth. Uh, for the and and also uh, you know for the technology companies as as well, right? All of those things are true for the established technology, the, the established financial services organizations. Uh, you know, on the one hand, the existing you know legacy infrastructure. Uh, you know, one might argue that it is a hindrance, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also um, a, a differentiating asset. And the reason for that is the financial the established financial services organizations have assets that the fintechs don't have. And that is, you know, they have uh, all of this historical data and they have all of this knowledge um, from their uh, interactions with their customers. And so being able to mine all of that information uh, for competitive advantage and uh, to drive innovation um, is a huge asset that they have. And so being able to you know, tap into all of that um, latent value in all of the historical information experience that they have and make use of it in a variety of ways is absolutely um, an asset. And then the the other um, sort of change in what's happening is in the data management space, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, being, that's being done right now around incorporating uh, the, the data and the uh, application functionality without doing a rip and replace, right? Because you have a lot of these powerful legacy systems in place that um, organizations have been using for a while. They scale, they're resilient. In many cases, they're bulletproof, right? So, uh, you know, there's a lot of strength there. And, uh, you know, there's a, 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 a set of advances that the, the architect, the enterprise architects and the analysts are calling an enterprise data fabric. And it's different from data lakes and creating new, you know, yet another data silo. And it's this dynamic fabric that you can enable uh, within your organization that connects to all of these legacy assets and data sources on demand and pulls uh, in data on demand for a variety of uh, either decision support, analytics types of use cases, or to feed new types of innovative services, and also to encapsulate uh, functionality from your existing applications to combine through the use of microservices and orchestrating APIs and so on and so forth um, to be able to innovate. So, you know, on the one hand, you can think of sort of all of this legacy infrastructure, which is hard, right, to, to sort of get your, uh, your arms around and, and be able to fully leverage as a hindrance. But there's a tremendous amount of latent value there. And again, with uh, you know, new approaches like smart enterprise data fabrics that allow you to keep all of this, uh, all of these assets in place and be able to uh, leverage them on demand, uh, both for uh, you know, innovation and digital transformation, creating new services, but also um, in terms of being able to get information in the moment. And that's really in large part what we were talking about at the asset, at the outset, which is, you know, how do I in the moment understand, you know, what my enterprise risk profiles are? You know, what's my liquidity risk? What does treasury look like? All of those things um, are now being enabled um, through these new approaches. Great. Yeah, I like that. Taking banks core competencies that they have already and, and leveraging that uh, to help them compete. Yeah, Great. exactly. Well, that's all we have time for today. Joe, I'd like to thank you. This has been Joe Lichtenberg at Intersystems. And also a special thanks to you, our audience.